start uh, advancing your own slides. Thank you. Excellent. Well, welcome back, everybody, and welcome to the very last session. I really, really cannot believe this is the last session. It feels like we just started together, but as I was saying just before the recording started, we've had 84 meals since we last started, so that's a lot of information going into the old body to either store fat or burn fat, become inflamed or not become inflamed, um, regulate our hormones, our appetite, all of those things. So every meal, like uh, my big slogan is is um, get healthy one meal at a time. So every meal is, is another chance to kind of hop back on and, and uh, make a different decision. Uh, so if you've had a few meals where, you know, you couldn't quite check the one cup of veggie box, no worries. What I love to do in that situation is use that as a teaching point in terms of, you know, no, no judgment, only compassion for yourself. And then you can look at the situation and say, hey, like, what, what was it about this meal that, um, you know, where, what was it about this meal that I couldn't actually get a cup of veggies on my plate? Was I not prepared? Was it, was I out? You know, what was it? Um, was I stressed? You know, all of these things that play into whether we do or don't meet the one cup of veggies is, is something worth really looking objectively at when you're in the space to do it. So today, um, I, I'm excited about today because I built these slides for today, so partly it's review, so you'll see some of the same slides that you've seen before just to kind of reinforce certain points, but um, the majority of what we're going to talk about today is actually um, came about from some of the questions that I received from you um, in terms of, you know, some of the information that we went over that maybe wasn't clear, and so I've tried to um, definitely touch on all of those points so that everything becomes really solidified for you. So hopefully um, you'll find that uh, useful in terms of uh, the example that I'm gonna, we're gonna kind of go through together. So uh, it is probably gonna take the hour and I'd love as much um, participation as possible and there'll be lots of opportunity to do so, but I also want to let you know that part of the participation may require your calculator. <laughs> So if you have your iPhone or your computer or whatever, or just a good old fashioned calculator, you may wanna get it out and just have it sitting there beside you. Um, and we'll go get to that in a little bit. So uh, really the whole point of this program was to get us focusing on nutrient dense food. And we talked on the very first day that probably the most, not probably, the most nutrient dense food that you could possibly eat is vegetables because they're not very calorically dense, like a cup of cauliflower, for example, would have like 40 calories. So it's not a lot of calories, but it's loaded, just absolutely loaded with nutrition. So in terms of nutrients per calories, veggies are your best bang for your buck. Um, but we went on to talk about other things that are good bang for your buck, which are healthy fat, um, enough protein, fruit, um, starchy vegetables like um, beets and you know, like kind of root vegetables, sweet potatoes, even wild rice, some like legumes too. So um, we've sort of talked all about nutrient dense food, how to kind of compile that on your plate so that you're building a plate at each meal um, in a way that's gonna get you the right kind of ratios that you're looking for. Um, I am going to turn my video off again because again I find that distracting. So this is this is uh, you've seen this probably in every <laughs> every session that we've had, but this is kind of I'm air quoting here, but like the plate. Like when I teach courses, I call it the plate. So this is how I like to train people to think about building their meals because while it's all well and good to say we should have this much percent of fat and this percent of carbs and this percent of protein, not a lot of people really know what that looks like on their plate, which is why I prefer this kind of visual guide. So this is kind of the nutrient-dense stuff. I guess what's not super clear here, because I, I highlight non-starchy veg, but I just mentioned the starchy veg that's certainly included that won't really push you um, into those upper um, 300 and some grams per day of carbohydrates like I used to eat. Um, it'll still keep you in that 100 to 150 range that we talked about as being ideal. 
What we don't want to eat is a lot of processed food <laughs> because processed food is probably the very definition of empty calories in a lot of ways. So it's going to be um, a lot of carbohydrate calories, but not really very high nutrition per calorie. It's a lot of artificial flavors and colors and chemicals. It's uh, added salt and sugar and umpteen different forms. We've got those vegetable oils or seed oils that really drive inflammation within the body. So in a nutshell, the big message is to ditch the processed food. And it's really funny because at, cert, at a certain level, I think we all kind of realize and know that someday we are going to have to kind of prioritize our healthy lifestyle, our, our healthy food and activity and all of this stuff. But I think we often feel invincible when we're young, especially um, thinking, oh, yeah, I don't have to worry about that. I can get away with it. But I love this cartoon because it's sort of like, okay, doc, give it to me straight. Like, how many more days do I have before I have to switch to this healthy lifestyle? So I love that cartoon. So um, this is something that we haven't quite touched on. I guess I've alluded to it, but uh, haven't quite touched on it. And I have a nice typo there, I can see. But um, is that... This is this is the breakdown of the calorie content of each macronutrient. So carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Carbohydrates and protein each have four calories per gram. And fat has nine calories per gram. And then I just put here, this is where the myth that eating fat makes you fat is derived from. So the very, by very virtue of the fact that fat has more than twice as many calories per gram as either carbohydrates or protein, that has sort of um, given birth to this myth that eating fat then will make you fat. But as I showed you, uh, in one of the, I think it was the second session, a day in my old life of eating where I had a lot of processed food and um, car empty carbohydrate, like wheat, mostly wheat-based calories, um, and how that really actually drove, um, not so much in my case fat, but it drove inflammation uh, a lot more than when I eat a whole lot more fat as I do right now and less carbohydrates. So um, this this myth of eating fat makes you fat will kind of expand on that today. It's somewhat of a new concept, but we talked in another um, session about how you're either a sugar burner or you're a fat burner. And I certainly used to be a sugar burner. If you can remember, like three quarters of my calories every day used to come from sugar, sort of unbeknownst to me. It was like a bit of an in disguise, like um, a frozen lasagna here and a sandwich there and a muffin from Tim Hortons here. And it was all kind of in disguise and I didn't really think of it as me eating a lot of sugar because I wasn't eating a lot of candy and desserts and that stuff. But uh, it really was sugar at the end of the day. So what I want to pose to you right now is how many calories roughly does a moderately active female adult need? So does anyone have, um, actually, if you just want to maybe grab your uh, text tool there, um, like that, your text tool, you could just, just um, here sort of put a, put a guess down. How many calories? does a moderately active female need roughly? So we've got 15 to 1,800 as a guess. You can put a range like that. Someone else said 15 to 1,800. Someone said 2,000. Any other guesses? It is actually about 2,200. 2,200 calories for a moderately active female. So we're going to remember that um, going forward and we'll, we'll be using that again. Um, someone is calorie what we need to focus on or the, yeah, so we're, we're actually going to, it's a good question, Claudine. She asked, is the, 
Is it the calories we need to focus on or the percent of percentage of macronutrients? And I guess it's kind of both and it's kind of neither. <laughs> And what I would argue is that if you, if we build the, our plates the way that I've just shown there in the last slide, like half to two thirds of the plate as vegetables and maybe some starchy stuff like a sweet potato or a piece of fruit or some hummus or something, and then your own palm size of protein and drizzle it all in a few tablespoons of healthy fat, then you're actually going to land without any further thought in the right calorie range and the right percentage of macronutrients. And we're going to go through that exact thing today. So I'm, I'm not, I, I, I'm going to show you both calories and percent macronutrients today, but what I'm advocating is that it doesn't, it's good to know about this stuff, but we don't need to make it that complicated at mealtime because we know as soon as we make it complicated at mealtime, people aren't going to do it. But I appreciate that people want the background understanding, the background knowledge as to why they're doing what they're doing, which is what I'm hopefully going to be able to um, convey today. So <clears throat> you remember my carbohydrate thermometer where I said that 100 to 150 grams per day is roughly where we're trying to land in for being a good fat burner as well as um, not having inflammation gone wild in your body like I used to have. So I took you through a day in my life, the way I used to eat, you know, the cereal and the orange juice at breakfast and the, the snacks and, and all of that. Um, you can look at that in session two. And what, where I landed on this thermometer was way up here. I think it was like 380 some grams of carbohydrates per day. And how did I feel? Well, I felt hangry, like really hungry and really angry <laughs> every two hours uh, when my blood sugar would drop. Uh, I had cravings, like sugar cravings galore. Sometimes I could use my willpower to not give in to them, and then other times I would just like completely binge and feel really bad about myself and then do it again the next day and kind of get in that spiral. So it was like really I felt super out of control around food. And then, and I always felt a little bit bloated and I had really wicked joint pain, like they thought I had rheumatoid arthritis, and I think I shared that story. So I started getting worked up for that and really never occurred to me through all of this, even though I was a healthcare professional, it never occurred to me that my food choices were actually playing into any of these things. That's how kind of uh, in the dark I was, um, which shocks me actually <laughs> that we never learned all that stuff in school I, as a physical therapist. So the way that I eat right now lands me in this in this range quite nicely without weighing, measuring, or counting anything ever. I just eat according to that plate that I've laid out for you guys. And uh, what do I feel now? I feel mildly hungry. Like it's sort of like a, it's not, the, I, the quality of my hunger has completely changed. So whereas when I was eating way up here, I felt like it was an emergency. When I got hungry, it was like, get out of my way. I need some food. And now it's like, yeah, I could eat. And this is after, like, I can go five, six hours without eating sometimes. And it's like, I can always go like f about four, four and a half hours before I need to eat anything. But often I can go longer. And then it's just mild hunger. Um, I'm about 10 pounds lighter despite no change in my activity level. And my joint pain is completely gone. And a side note here is that my total calories, which we tend to get really focused on, my total calories were the same here as they are here. Like the calories are exactly the same, but the, the makeup of those calories or the quality of those calories has completely changed to the point where here it's very, very high nutrition per calorie, where here it was very low nutrition per calorie. So it is time for those calculators. So what I want to do with you to help you guys really, um, really take this information in and, and not ever really forget it is that 
I want you to figure out how many calories are in 150 grams of carbs, given what I've just told you. So let's say you want to eat at the top of the anti-inflammatory and fat burning range. So you want to land about around 150 grams per day. So grab your pointers and claim some white space here and throw out a number of how many calories 150 grams of carbs is based on what we learned two slides ago. <laughs> I see 16 as a guess. I see five as a guess. I see 600 and 500 as a guess. All right. So I'm just going to flip to the next slide. So I've taken the liberty of actually um, spelling this out. So remember two slides ago, we learned that protein and carbohydrates both have four calories per gram. So if we're aiming to eat 150 grams of carbohydrates in a day, then it's just 150 times four, which is 600 calories. So great, we've eaten 600 calories of carbohydrate in the form of mostly vegetables, some fruit, some starchy stuff, maybe some legumes and beans. Okay, great. And assuming now that this is that moderately active female who eats 2,200 calories a day, what percentage of those calories would be carbs then? So what percentage is 600 into 2200? <laughs> you didn't know this was going to be math class, hey? <laughs> okay, so we have a 36% guess. And again, I've Tammy, did you have a guess, or is that you in green? Oh, that's that's you, Joanna. Okay, good. All right, so we have a couple guesses. I'm going to just flip to the next slide. So 600, if you take your calculators and you go 600 divided by 2200, you get 0.27 repeating. And then to get the percentage, you just multiply by 100. And that's how we get 27%. So I really wanted to show you this because it, it can be confusing when we switch between like grams per day to percentages to what that looks like on your plate. They're all different um, ways of calculating the same thing. So it's, I guess, can be confusing when I'm switching back and forth. But what we're, what I'm advocating here is that even at the upper end of this range, you're eating only about a third or less than a third of your total calories in the day as carbohydrates, which is kind of interesting, right? But Canada's food guide or what's whatever the equivalent in the States, I'm not sure. Does anyone want to help me out here? Standard American diet, maybe? Anyways. Um, it usually advocates eating about 55% of your daily calories as carbohydrates. So if that were the case, how many grams would that be? So let's assume again that we've got a, a moderately active female who eats 2,200 calories a day. What would, how many calories would that be if 55% of her calories came from carbohydrates? What's the math formula? <laughs> Any guesses? All right, I'll tell you. So, in order to figure that out, you take 2200 and multiply it by 0.55, so 55%, and you get 1,210 calories of carbohydrates. 
And then we know that every carbohydrate calorie is four, gram, four calories per gram. So you go 12, 10 divided by four and you get 302. So really what Canada's food guide anyways is advocating is that we eat way up here in the danger zone. <laughs> and remember my, um, um, sorry, let me, remember my day of eating, which was way up here and the way that I felt when I ate that, like hungry all the time, joint pain, extra weight, bloating that I couldn't get rid of. So when you hear from now on, you know, eat 55% of your calories as carbohydrates, you just have to, I guess what I'm trying to get you to do is be able to critically think, like, is that what's going to make me feel well, have energy, be able to burn fat, and instead of store fat, all of that. And, and you have to compare this with your personal experience too. Like, uh, how do I feel when I eat one way or another? So remember we talked about when we eat a lot of carbohydrate, even if it's that disguised carbohydrate as, um, uh, you know, cereal and bread and pasta and lasagna and all that stuff, that's kind of what I would call disguised carbohydrate. Uh, what happens is your blood sugar spikes. We then, in response to the blood sugar spike, produce a lot of this hormone called insulin. And insulin, insulin's whole job is to shuttle that energy into your fat cells. So it shuts off fat burning and puts you in a fat storage mode. And then if that goes on again and again and again, meal after meal, decade after decade, what happens is that we start to um, gain weight. Do we have any questions at this point? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just looking at the chat now because I find it hard to monitor the chat and, um, and talk at the same time, but I'm seeing your comments now and I'm laughing. Um, Claudine, go ahead. Hi, thank you for all this. It's very uh, interesting. I'm just wondering, like, do you know with all your research, like, I mean, everything like I follow is very well explained. I understand, but I'm still puzzled as like, I, I spoke, you know, with nutritionists and they're still talking about the exact like same percentage you were talking for the carbohydrate because they're like, oh, you know, you have a, you need it for your brain and blah, blah, blah. But why, why, like, yeah, so it's, it's why a nutritionist would still um, suggest something that you just demonstrate doesn't make sense. I mean, they, 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 this is their, like, their, their, um, their, their speciality. You know, they, they, they study, they go to, this is what they do in life, and they still don't, like, I just don't get it. Well, I don't, I, I'm 100% with you, and I think it's um, because that paradigm shift can be really hard to see. Like, they're in a, in a paradigm of carbohydrate, like, we need carbohydrates, and they're, I, I guess, I don't want to knock nutritionists. Like, I mean, I believe that they're trying to give the best advice that they can, but you're right. Like, it, we need to step back and say, does this make sense? Because every nutritionist in the world would also agree with insulin as a fat storage hormone. Like, they understand that insulin is a fat storage hormone. There's no controversy there. So, to me, it doesn't make sense why we would keep telling people, oh, just eat whole wheat bread instead of white bread because it's going to slow your um, insulin response or your blood sugar response a little bit more. And I'm kind of thinking, how about not eat bread at all because we can get our carbohydrate calories elsewhere. And when we're not bathed in this high sugar, high insulin kind of situation all the time, then we are fat burners and we can actually use our our body's own, um, like a byproduct of our of fat metabolism called ketones. We can use that, and the brain actually prefers ketones to carbohydrates. So it, it's such a good question. I don't have the answer mm -hmm. as to why we keep giving this advice when it's clearly not working for people. That's why I say that all of this has to be um, looked at alongside your personal experience. Like, try this for one month. 
try eating the plate or real food for one month and see how you feel. Are you hangry anymore? Like, did you just lose 10 pounds and you didn't even try? Like, that's the kind of stuff I hear every day in my job. And it's so it, I feel really um, passionate that <laughs> this is like from everything I've seen, this works. And this is, you know, how we used to live like 10,000 years ago before we had this, all of this carbohydrate dense food at our disposal all the time. If you think about it, um, we wouldn't have had access to this much carbohydrate ever before in human history until like about 10,000 years ago and the advent of agriculture. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Everyone else good with that? So the, the reverse here is just, you know, as soon as you moderate your carbohydrate intake and kind of land in that 100 to 150, even if you're at the top of that zone, like at 150, like we just saw, you're still only maybe eating 27% um, carbohydrate and that's enough to fuel your brain and some other cells in your body, like your red blood cells and some kidney cells that that work mostly off of carbohydrate, but you're, you become a much, much better fat burner and then you start seeing your fat cells shrink and you have access to that energy so you don't get those mid-afternoon, mid-morning crashes. Okay, um, we talked about this too as like protein, we can only metabolize so much protein, so it's kind of like we're either a carb, we're either a sugar burner or a fat burner, sugar burner or a fat burner, and we're going to see like clearly that I was a sugar burner in my former life, and we're going to see today that now I'm a fat burner. So um, one other thing that I wanted to just really show you visually, because again, I'm a visual learner, and I think many people are. When we're talking about calories, and then talking about getting calories from carbohydrates or fat, this is what that looks like. So you could have an entire cup of cauliflower, or you could have one teaspoon of olive oil. Both, both of these things are very, very healthy, and they have a place on our plate. As, we, as I showed you at the beginning, but look at the size difference. So when I say that maybe we're striving to eat equal amounts of, of carbs and fat, that doesn't mean equal quantities. It just means equal calorie content, but look at the huge size difference between a full cup of cauliflower and what that would take, the space that would take up on your plate versus like what you would put in your dressing, your salad dressing. So I hope that kind of helps to sort out the the calorie thing and and why um, you know even though we're I'm recommending yeah you eat enough fat it doesn't take up a whole lot of space on your plate and and your plate is still going to be made up of mostly plants. <laughs> Any questions on that? Awesome. Okay, so this was actually, this is the most fun part of today's presentation for me, is that I get asked all the time from people, and several of you have written into me and asked, like, okay, so what would you eat in a day? So I, I thought it would be a nice demo to go through, like, a typical day. And so I, I'm, I can read this out, or you can read it, but what I want you to think about is that plate. Like, I have... I, what I put at the bottom here is like, I never, ever, ever measure, weigh, or count anything anymore. Like, I never concern myself with uh, percentages of that pie at all, like carb, protein, fat. I never think about that. I just eat the plate, and the plate lands me in the right zones for everything. But for demonstrative purposes today, I really want to take you through my typical day. So think about the plate when you think about my breakfast. So I would typically have like a three egg omelet, which most of the time turns into a scramble because I always mess up the flip. Like my husband is amazing at flipping omelets, but I'm just a disgrace when it comes to flipping omelets. So my omelets turn into scramble. So three eggs with like a cup of veg, maybe a slice of prosciutto. I top the whole thing with maybe like a quarter um, of an avocado, a quarter cup of salsa. I have a side of blueberries and two cups of coffee with heavy cream. So this is like a very typical breakfast for me. And when you think about the plate, 
it all kind of fits, right? So most of it was veg. I had my hand, my palm size of protein, which was the three eggs and the prosciutto. And then uh, the healthy fat, I've got healthy fat in the avocado, which is on top, and the cream, which is in my coffee. And then my carbohydrates are coming from the blueberries. So that would be like a breakfast. And then usually I'm not hungry between breakfast and lunch when, when I eat like this. So lunch um, typically would be like a giant spinach salad, like tons and tons of veg. I use the old, like, what else can I add? Like, I just kind of look in my fridge and just chop up when I, whatever I have. But I think in, um, the exam in this example, I had cucumbers, um, tomatoes, uh, red onions, feta cheese, um, I forget what else I put in there, but a huge salad, tons of veg, five ounces of chicken, two slices of bacon, three olives. Um, I topped the whole thing off with pine nuts and an olive oil and balsamic based dressing. So that would be like a very typical lunch for me. And then snack if I need it, like I don't always need it because I don't really get that hungry, but uh, if I were to have a snack, I'd maybe have like a banana and almond butter. So I just kind of dip the banana in my almond butter. Um, and then dinner would be like steak and steamed veggies drizzled with butter, half a sweet potato, and a five ounce glass of Merlot. So hands up if if anyone would look at that food or that day and think like, oh, there's nothing to eat. I feel so deprived. I would feel so deprived if I had to eat that. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, hands up if this looks like a pretty yummy day of eating. Cool. Yum, yum, yum. Awesome. All right. Unanimous. Okay. Now the fun part. So, what I did, just for demonstrative purposes, again, super demonstrative purposes, not that I would advocate you do this all the time, but I went on to fitday.com, and this is a free online nutritional calculator that if this kind of nerdy stuff like interests you and you're curious as to kind of the breakdown of what you would eat in a day, I would encourage you to go on and do it. It's very, very easy, but this is my whole day of what I just laid out to you, put in through a, nutri a nutritional calculator, and I realize you're not probably able to see this, but it's, um, this is calories, this is fat, carbohydrates, and protein. So it breaks every single little thing down and, and gives the total. So the total calories that I just ate in my typical day are 2,338. So we just talked about a moderately active female being needing around 2,200 calories in a day. And I'm a little, I would say I'm, I'm an active female because I am training for a marathon. So the fact that I'm eating a little bit more didn't, didn't stress me out whatsoever. And then I ate 146.8 grams of fat in that day. 123.5 grams of carbs and 123.8 grams of protein. So, on back to my, my carbohydrate thermometer, I landed like pretty much as in the middle of that anti inflammatory fat burning zone as you could possibly be. And I've never measured, counted, or weighed a thing. All I've done is eat according to that plate. But that's kind of, I guess, the very biggest take home point from this whole course is that when you eat according to that plate, you just kind of land in there without having to weigh, measure and count. Yeah, Joanna? So Carolyn, I would love to know, in all of your work with individuals, have you ever experienced someone who follows who follows that kind of a day of eating um, regularly and for some reason doesn't lose weight? Have you ever encountered that? I have encountered people that are slower to lose weight than others. So I've actually worked with several people who 
who follow this to a T. They would eat eat a day like that, you know, meal after meal, like 84 meals in a row, and they're like, hello, what is going on? Like the scale hasn't budged and they're very frustrated. And typically, those are people that have been, um, how do I say this? Like they, they've kind of beaten their body up for many years and maybe even decades prior to coming to see me. So I, I would describe a person like that as more like metabolically broken. <laughs> okay. And sometimes it takes them longer to respond. So while, um, like, for example, when I kind of switched to eating like this, I noticed a difference like within 10 days. I, I could go for five hours all of a sudden within 10 days and I felt amazing and my joint pain went away and I was very quick to respond. And then I get these other people that do it very much to the T and they do it for three months and nothing happens. And then in the fourth month, it's like piles of weight fall off. Hmm. Interesting. So I've never worked with anyone who actually does it. Um, you know, like they're not cheating all the time type thing. Uh, you know, they're not, don't have to be perfect, but they're, they're doing it mostly like 80%, you know, and, uh, and not lose weight. I've never worked with anyone like that. It just takes some people longer for their bodies to respond. Exactly, exactly. So their metabolism is just like slower to kind of move. Yep. Okay, thanks for sharing. Cool. So um, so I took the liberty of making another pie graph, not because I think that you need to do this, but just to show you visually that my typical day of eating is like over half fat. Like 56.5% of the calories that I take in are fat. And, and now think about what I just told you that was. Like, where did that fat come from? Like, can you guys just grab your pointer and put it within this big red section of the fat and tell me what that, what, where the fat came from? And I'll start off by offering up this one. Okay, so my morning breakfast had... I had a quarter of an avocado in there. <clears throat> and when I actually have the breakdown right in front of me, so my quarter avocado was 7.4 grams of fat. Uh, yes, yes, avocado. The heavy cream, yes. Uh, the heavy cream was 3.3 .3 grams of fat. The olive oil, Oh, I put two tablespoons of olive oil in the dressing for my lunch, and that was 27 grams of fat. Jennifer Campbell, olive oil, <laughs> Tammy Kingston, yes. So olive oil is not bad for you. Olive oil is amazing for you, but it's going to rack up your calories. Like two tablespoons of olive oil is 27 grams of carbs and 239 calories, and that was all in my lunch. Yes, the bacon um, the bacon wasn't actually as bad as I thought it would be. It was 4.2 grams in two slices of bacon in my salad at lunch. Um, yes, the eggs, 17.6 grams of fat in my three eggs at breakfast. Um, butter, yes. Where did I, oh yeah, the butter was my dinner. The butter had, um, 17.3 grams of fat in one and a half tablespoons of butter. <laughs> so can you see, like, I hope that this um, is helpful. What I think might also be helpful is if we go, if we take, move our pointers to the carbohydrate, the orange one, and just kind of brainstorm where my carbs came from because we're talking about trying to get carbs from certain uh, real food sources as opposed to like processed food. So um, where, where were my main Yes, my blueberries, my quarter cup of blueberries in the morning had uh, 5.4 grams of carbohydrate. 
And my banana, good one, my banana had 27 grams of carbohydrates in my snack, yeah. Uh, the sweet potato was uh, almost 12. I had half a sweet potato at dinner. The veggies are all kind of, because I had so many veggies, right? Like there was uh, two to three cups of vegetables in all of these meals. <laughs> so my veg, but mostly non-starchy, I would say, were mine. So they're pretty negligible, but they still add up. Um, oh yeah, and the wine. Anyone curious about the wine? My wine was 3.7 grams of carbohydrates in the five ounce glass of Merlot. And if you recall from an earlier lesson, um, I stop at one glass of wine because once I start doing two and three, then all hell breaks loose. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I have a question from Jennifer. Can you speak quickly to eating this way with kids? This is one thing I struggle with time-wise because they will only eat some of what I, what I eat. Oh my goodness, such a good question. Like we could have probably an entire course on how to feed your children. It's so hard, depending on the age of the kid, eating another way or not. Actually, Jennifer, to add to that. Can Joanna maybe mute? Because we're hearing a whole bunch of typing. Oh, yeah. I can't hear you, Carolyn. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so awesome question about the kids. And what I will say, like, I'll just speak from my personal experience here with my own kids, is that they were only two and four years old when I sort of gone on this crazy real food path. So um, even though they were heavily entrenched in their goldfish crackers and Cheerios and pasta and all the stuff that kids love, um, the bland beige glop, uh, it was still tricky, like especially for my four-year-old because he was old enough to be like, no, this is not what we have, you know? So um, all, I, all I'll say is that it's absolutely possible. Like right now, my kids eat 100% the way that we do, but it's a slower transition, like a much, much slower transition. So I'll give you an example of one of the things that um, that I did is, so my kids loved vanilla yogurt. So when I looked at the nutritional facts on the yogurt, it was like 27 grams of yogurt in every serving that they had, even though I thought like vanilla, that's not so bad. Um, so I wanted to transition them to plain yogurt, but I knew there was no way that I was just going to be able to fool them and just start giving them plain yogurt without backlash. So what I did was I would buy a tub of vanilla and a tub of plain, and I would mix them together. <laughs> um, so I would mix them like three quarters vanilla to one quarter plain at first, and they really didn't notice the difference whatsoever. So that was fine. So I knew they were getting like 25% better yogurt than they were in the past. And then just slowly over time, like over about maybe a month, I slowly changed the ratio. So then they were having half and half, and then they were having three quarters plain, one quarter uh, vanilla. And then finally they were having all plain with maybe like a teaspoon of maple syrup in it. I still do that from time to time with the kids. So, um, so yeah, and, and I just like expose them really slowly. Like you hear this a lot is just like present them with stuff on the plate and don't make a big deal of it and realize that, yep, a lot of it will just come back to the, like it'll stay on their plate by the end of the meal and that's okay and present it again. And um, yeah, I'm happy to have another conversation about this, but like I said, it could be a whole thing on its own because trying to get um, kids on board is a little trickier, especially um, I think I've heard from people that have teenagers that it's even more <laughs> of a of a trick or a little more tricky with teenagers than it is with younger kids. So, um, yeah, um, I would just say try to really capitalize on the things that they like. So, yeah, they like cucumbers, maybe present them with like a carrot stick along with their mostly cucumbers, you know, stuff like that. All right. You're welcome. Um, okay, so moving 
Oh, yeah. So moving on, um, the advice really does boil down to simple stuff that I've told you before, but Michael, Michael Pollan loved this quote, if it came from a plant, eat it, and if it was made in a plant, don't. <laughs> Uh, oh, sorry, we've got two questions. So, Rachel, do you want to go ahead? Sure. I know you want to move on from the children's stuff, but I do have a question about that. My kids are really great about eating their vegetables and eating fruit. They're fantastic about that, the way that their lunch cans are laid out. But what I struggle with is the main part of their lunch, mm. uh, some ideas to put in there. You know, I they absolutely will have their carrots and their cucumbers and peppers, all of that stuff, no problem. All kinds of different fruits, no problem. But I like to give them, you know, like a main part of their lunch. Yeah, I, I so hear you. Okay, here's what I do with my kids' lunches. And this, like, kids are, are creatures of habit, just as adults are. And I find it really interesting because my kids, I feel like sometimes like a bad mom because I just like put the same thing in their lunch every single day almost. And, uh, but they love it. Like they love getting the same thing in their lunch. So I'll tell you what goes in their lunch like every single day is a fruit cup, like an unsweetened fruit cup, um, a baby bell cheese. I put a big thing of veggies. So same as you, Rachel, is like carrots, peppers, and uh uh, cucumbers, because they love all three of those, but whatever your kids love, like get put, give the ones that are their most favorite. Um, I do, they, this is so bad, but the only thing, just like you, Rachel, like they'll eat so much stuff at home, like protein wise, they'll eat sausages and chicken and tuna and hamburgers and all kinds of stuff, but the only thing that they will eat in their lunch is bacon. So I put bacon in their lunch like every single day. Like they won't, every, anything else that I try to put in for a protein, it just comes back home. So that's just a maybe unique thing to my kid or maybe your kids like that too. Um, what else do I put? I put yogurt with a little teaspoon of honey in it. I put these energy balls that I make um, mostly like um, I use seed butter and coconut and dates and the recipes on the website, and I can share it with you guys. Um, they're called Primal Poppers, but I always make those on the weekend, so I put one of those in their lunch. Um, I put apple chips. I buy these apple chips from Costco. Uh, they are so amazing, so crunchy. Uh, the kids love it, and sometimes I put um, these seaweed papers. Um, what are they called? Seaweed snacks. I also buy them from Costco. And I put those in their lunch. And sometimes I put grapes or raspberries or whatever fruit I've got in the fridge, and sometimes not. So that's like every single day. And then water. <laughs> that's what they drink, eat. Does that help, Rachel? Yeah, that, that helps. I think the like the apple chips and the seaweed snack, I don't know if they do the seaweed snack, and the energy ball, I guess that gives it a bit more substance to the meal, I guess, is what I'm looking for, because they, you know, they're running off a lot of energy during the day, and I, I, I feel like if I'm just putting fruits and vegetables, well, lots of vegetables and fruits and, like, a cheese stick, it's not enough. It needs to be, like, how do I move away from the sandwich? Do you know what I mean? And they're not really big thermos kids. They don't, that once in a while, they'll be okay with having soup or something, but they don't love having that. So I'm just trying to figure out how to get away from the, you know, cheese and crackers and sandwich will yeah. be at that same part of their lunch. So thank you. Well, I would encourage you to just explore what are your kids' um, favorite kind of protein sources because it would seem like certainly that that part is harder in my kids' case to, to cover off if they're only going <laughs> to eat bacon. Like we, we just saw that bacon, two slices of bacon, which is maybe what I would put in their lunch, is um, – it's not a ton of protein, right? So there's a bit of protein in the yogurt that I give them, but really, other than that, there's not really too much protein. So, but maybe your kids would eat tuna in their lunch, or maybe they would eat a hamburger. Like, I, I don't know. So you know your kid the best, but try, I think that's probably the um, part that's missing the most or the hardest to sort of get in your kids' lunches on a regular basis. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. 
yeah, I wish we could have a whole session on kids, man. Um, but yeah, love this, love this um, quote and this one as well. I think I've introduced these before, but if your food can go bad for you, if your food can go bad, it's good for you. And if your food can't go bad, it's bad for you. So that's always a, a really good way to live by. Claudine. Claudine, do you have a question? Right. Hello, hello. Hi. Hello, do you hear me now? I can hear you now. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I was completely doing the opposite, I guess. Sorry. Um, the uh, the slide we saw recently, and it was like 38, 37% of either car uh, both carb and fat and about 25% of protein, it's different from that one. So really, it doesn't matter or what uh, is... Uh, really, it doesn't, it doesn't matter so much. Some people will need... Some people will need more uh, carbohydrates, especially if you're just transitioning to this way of eating. Okay. I don't really want you to aim for any particular um, thing, any particular percentage ratios necessarily. Mm -hmm. I would say eat according to the plate. And if you feel like, wow, I don't quite have enough energy or I feel low then you know maybe you eat a little bit more and kind of just play around with it and see how you feel but try to make those decisions as intuitively as you can like you may not be able to go straight to eating this much fat although what did you think when you saw what i would eat in a day like it doesn't kind of look like a lot of fat does it yeah because this is this slide is, has to do with the calorie right exactly yeah so so even though, you know, my omelet and my salad and my steak and veggies and my banana and almond butter, like, it doesn't, it doesn't look like, wow, she's eating so much fat. But I guess I just wanted to show you that when you're getting your fat from those healthy places and knowing that fat sort of adds up quickly in terms of like a bit of olive oil here, a bit of almond butter there, um, it, you can certainly you can certainly get like over 50% of your calories from fat fairly easily. And then guess what? You become an amazing fat burner and you're satiated and you, you're not hungry all the time. And so it's not that you're trying to go for any particular ratios. Like maybe at first you, you get a little more in by way of the carbohydrates. Like maybe you have a little more fruit than I did, or you have rice or, um, lentils or something and that would push this carbohydrate piece of the pie quite a little quite a lot bigger and that's fine because you're still going to get results mm -hmm. uh, assuming that you started off eating a lot more carbohydrate based food which most people do okay thanks you're welcome all right any other questions all right we are almost done i got through this a little faster than i thought i would so there's those two things to live by. And then, so what are we eating? Like this is a reminder of some some slides I showed you at the beginning, but uh, the way I like to kind of get more veg, more nutrient density in is by making kind of rice substitutes with cauliflower, broccoli, or carrots. Um, pasta substitutes with spaghetti squash or zucchini. Um, has anyone tried zucchini noodles or spaghetti squash in the last month? Hands up if you've uh, tried that. Yeah. And it's just such a, um, sorry, keep your hands up and your green checks on if you, if you liked that. Cool. Yeah. And then coleslaw substitutes, like this is a Brussels sprout based coleslaw but you could really do I make that um, a coleslaw out of carrots and fennel and apple so it's like you know it's just kind of expanding out um, your options and kind of thinking getting away from always like rice and pasta and sort of thinking what else could I have that's more nutrient dense per calorie less kind of empty calories and and go from there and the sky is totally the limit like you could Google any one of these things like 
Google spaghetti squash based entrees or spaghetti squash based side dishes or whatever. And like you would just be amazed how many things come up. Um, Rachel, go ahead. Sorry, I still had my hand up from before. <laughs> Claudine, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering, like the spaghetti, spaghetti squash and zucchini noodles, uh, like I tried to eat as much from the scratch as possible, but I found out that it's sometimes hard for me, the have ideas for uh, that problem, like it's sometimes hard to find um, like the, the sauce, the, the thing that you put on it. Like let's say I have veggie, yes, I have like a protein, but the, you know, I'm often I'm, I'm, I'm relying, I'm counting on this little, or sachet to put like a powder, like nor, you know, oh, acid or sauce or, you know, this things and that. And I know it's probably not awesome, but I, do you have like, do you know like brands or quick, um, I don't know, like way to make LT all kinds of sauce? <laughs> Yeah, well, usually, so on in terms of the spaghetti squash, what I usually do with that, because it does mimic, it looks and feels like pasta so much that any anything I would have put on pasta, I put on spaghetti squash and had it be a total hit. So just think of your classic kind of pasta sauce. Like I usually use, um, instead of like ragu, if you look at the ingredients on a lot of those um traditional pasta sauces, you'll see a lot of crap in there, like a lot of uh, hidden sugars, um, and it's crazy, but sometimes even like wheat and stuff, it just is amazing how much gets thrown into canned whether it's in a Yeah, whether it's in a glass jar or it's in a little piece of, you know, like a powder thing. Exactly, exactly. So what I, um, again, I'm such a Costco junkie, but I buy um, marinara sauce from Costco. So I use this marinara sauce as the base for any of the meat sauce that I make that goes on top of the spaghetti squash. And I usually put a can of tomato paste in with it as well. But you could use like diced tomatoes and a can of tomato paste and then all your like ground beef or ground turkey or lamb or like whatever kind of protein you want in there. And then just your onions, tomatoes, um, mushrooms, garlic, like whatever you would normally put in a sauce. So that would be kind of a traditional sauce. Um, I also maybe in the after notes or on the Facebook group, I'll put up um, this parsley and olive oil based sauce that I make for the zucchini noodles which is absolutely amazing it's fresh parsley like pretty much a whole like bunch of it that you would buy um, think of the size you would buy at the store and then I throw it down my food processor with like salt and pepper and garlic and and then I just put I turn it on and then I just put enough olive oil to kind of get it into like a sauce consistency and I throw that on top of the um, in, on top of the spaghetti, uh, the zucchini noodles, and it's oh, it's so good, it's amazing. Okay, so so to save time, there's not necessarily uh, a brand of product that makes us just like add water or add something, and there's not really that that mm -hmm. doesn't really exist, right? Not that I can think of. Like, um, no, you're still okay, kind of. I was just wondering. Yeah, sorry, but in terms of, again, the big rocks, mm -hmm. just switching from the spaghetti to the spaghetti squash is, like, that's your big rock, you know, and then if you're still using the nor um, or the, uh, what does my mom always use? Oh, my gosh, what is that stuff you would always put in soup? The powdered stuff, anyone? Oxo? Yeah, Oxo. <laughs> So, like, if you're still using that, yeah, it's probably got some MSG and some questionable ingredients. But, again, it's not the big rock. The big rock was switching from the carb-laden, like, pasta or whatever. Um, okay. Yeah. It's like the mayo and the ketchup. I saw some recipe. But I think it's awesome, but it doesn't seem to stay in the fridge for long. So that's where I'm like, hmm, it's not... Um, I would say get a handle on the big rocks and the, the making your own condiments. That's something that can come later because I think 
having thinking that you have to do all that right off the bat just sends people into overwhelm and it's really not necessary for the for the return on investment that you're going to get okay yes all right thanks um i will share rachel i will share the brussels sprout recipe um it is on our website but um the website it's hard to find the recipes on there i'm sure you've uh, i'm in the middle of having my website redesign so I'm hoping that it's a lot more user friendly um, very shortly. Um, okay, so these are just some more pictures of things that I might eat just to give your um, give you some more ideas. Uh, we talked about egg muffins and omelets and throwing veggies in a smoothie as um, kind of more traditional breakfast options. We talked about that the first day I think. We talked about the strategy of monitoring whatever gets measured gets managed. This is a very long standing kind of um, mantra, I guess, in business. Uh, so if we're not measuring, and, and I think that's true for a lot of people is that, you know, maybe we hear this advice of like, eat this and that and whatever, and we get so overwhelmed that we just, we know we don't measure anything and we have no idea how many carbs we're eating or fat or anything because we find it all so confusing and, we have to get out our calculators and all of this stuff. So um, what I like to do is just getting people like measuring a few of the big rocks, like um, eating a cup of vegetables at every meal. It kind of gets you most of the way there without having to do any further thought. So uh, feel free to use this sheet that I've provided for you for this challenge. Need, use it whenever you need a boost, whenever you need kind of a another challenge to take on um, if you feel like three months down the road that you're, um, you need another boost. Um, we talked about the strategy of convenience. So this question is something that guides so many of my decisions in the kitchen is how can I make it as simple a, a, and convenient as possible to eat vegetables? Because we know they're not as convenient as pretty much any other food to eat, but we also know that we need to eat them. So how can we make it as simple and convenient as possible? Then all kinds of solutions kind of roll themselves out on a red carpet like, oh, I could have little chopping sessions with my with my kids um, and we can cut up like, wow, you can cut up tons of vegetables in half an hour, you know? and then they're ready to go, and then it's just as easy as like a bag of chips. So stuff like that. Um, we talked about the strategy of scheduling. Somebody brought this up on the first day, and I love this Stephen Covey quote, the key is not to prioritize what's on your schedule, but to schedule your priorities. And I think a lot of people would say that eating well is a big priority, but we don't always kind of follow through with that. And so I, I try to help people with the follow through. Okay, what's standing your way? How can we kind of make this more of a priority without sort of sending you into overwhelm? Um, what about storing the veggies? How long are you able to keep them fresh in the fridge? This actually doesn't even come into play in my family because I, I cut up so many vegetables and I think like, oh my goodness, it's not like, we're never gonna get through all of these. And there's four of us, right? And we do, we get all through them all in a couple days and then I'm having to cut up more. So how long do they keep in the fridge fresh? I would say probably three or four days. If you do a big chopping session with um, your veggie tray, let's say, three or four days. Obviously stuff like peppers may not last as long as something like carrots uh, in a that cut up form, but, um, in our house anyways, the peppers always go first. <laughs> All right, um, so don't forget, now I'm not sure if people have signed up. I do have, um, actually last week, Joanna sent out or attached to the after session email this uh, one week meal plan. Um, so feel free to peruse through that. This is a picture of everything that went into the one week meal plan um, and uh, I don't have the meal plan. The cover page looks like this, but there's another page that has all the meals, like meal one, two, three. And what if you just hover over the writing on each one, it actually hyperlinks to the recipe. Any of any of the the ones that require recipes, it hyperlinks right over to the recipe. I think the Brussels sprout one is on there, actually, Rachel. Um, question from Rachel. Go ahead. I just had a quick question about the waiter bread because I made some and it's green all on the inside. So what makes it green? 
I should have, I should give like a big warning. Um, so I think in the, in the recipe, I say use either sunflower seeds or sesame seeds. And whenever I make it, I always use sesame seeds. I don't know why they, they're just the ones that I have most available. But if you use sunflower seeds, it's something about the chemical reaction of the sunflower seeds and the baking soda that turns it green. And so I get all these like frantic emails and phone calls from people being like, oh my gosh, I just made it. How could it have gone bad already? And it's not bad. It's just the chemical reaction. <laughs> Uh, that's what I figured must have happened. I figured it was the sunflower seeds, but I thought I might just check. Yeah, that's it. So if it if it bothers you or maybe if it bothers your kids to eat something green, then I would just say switch to the sesame seeds. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> All right, and I think we're on our last slide, which is um, big mucho gracias to all of you. Um, huge thanks and gratitude for um coming into this program and allowing me to kind of share with you everything that I've learned. I had so much fun, like so, so, so much fun with it. And um, if you have any questions, actually, this is the, ne the next one. If you uh, have any questions at all, we can uh, take a few minutes now or don't hesitate to contact me through email and the Facebook group. Like the Facebook group, if people find it useful, can live on. Um, I'm willing to do that, uh, so let me know. <laughs> Any questions at all? I, I did have one more thing. I was wondering about the plate, whether that had been sent in an email. Um, I didn't see it anywhere, the, the visual of the plate. Okay, I, Joanna, I believe, did we send that one in the first after session email or second one? I can I don't remember which one, but we did send it. But you know what I'll do, everybody, is um, I will, in our after session email for today, what I'll do is I'm going to resend every thing that we've attached and to all the emails, just in case anybody's missed them. And that way, um, you know, you don't have to go searching through your emails again. And also, uh, please note that we will be having a survey that I'm going to include in that after session email. And we'd really love to get your feedback on how you felt the class was. Um, so watch for that too, and please do take care of it. And uh, Carolyn, a uh, round of applause to you. As you can see, everybody's been giving you rounds of applause. And what a great program this has been, and so challenging and informative and just wonderful. Yeah, I, I really, this is the first time I've ever done anything like this. And of course, I was wondering how this all going to go to everyone, but it's been so much fun and like just such a, such a great thing. I really hope we can do it again. Are there any final questions for her? And um, the Facebook group is still up. Do you want to leave it up for maybe one more week just for any burning questions or? Absolutely. Yeah, Great. I'll leave it up and uh, certainly you can private message me through there if you've got personal questions or send me an email at carolyncoffin at simpatico.ca. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Perfect. Well, it looks like no one has any questions right now. So thank you everybody for participating with us. Um, please remember that when you see on our Facebook pages or in the newsletters that we send from MFS US um, that there are lots of virtual programs that are going on. Um, not always as interactive as this one because this one was so amazing, but we do have lots that are happening. And so just watch for those in um, on social media and in your local and the national newsletter. So thanks, everybody, and you're welcome to leave uh, whenever you'd like. I can stay for a couple minutes if